but it didn't have a functionality that he was he was supply chain member. It didn't have a functionality that he absolutely must have. However, he was only one vote. There was ten other votes. Yeah. So he got outvoted. And you know, it it, it always blows my mind how people do these evaluations and how they try to figure out which is the best ERP for them. You want to talk to companies that are similar. Growing a business requires a holistic approach that extends beyond sales and marketing. This approach needs alignment among people, processes, and technologies. So if you're a business owner, operations, or finance leader looking to learn growth strategies from your peers and competitors, you're tuned into the right podcast. Welcome to the WBS Podcast, where scalable growth using business systems is our number one priority. Now... Here is your host, Sam Gupta. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the WBS Podcast. I'm Sam Gupta, your host and principal consultant at Independent ERP and digital transformation consulting firm, Elevate IQ. The systems designed for process manufacturing differ completely from discrete manufacturing. The process manufacturing verticals are also deep into logistics and transportation management, as the regulatory bodies might need to report as part of the traceability compliance. They also have very strong QC requirements with the shop floor equipment integrated. Finally, recipe management and yield calculation are completely different from discrete verticals. So which system in the Aptine portfolio is designed for process manufacturing? If you have guessed Aptine Ross, then you are right. In today's episode, we invited a panel of industry experts for a live discussion on LinkedIn to conduct an independent review of Aptin Ross capabilities. We covered many grounds, including its unique features for the F&B industries. Finally, we discussed the nuances of process manufacturing industries and drew parallels with some of the discrete industries. With that, Let's get to the conversation. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's show. If you are joining for the first time, this is part of our industry seat for which we meet every Tuesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. We review one vendor or the solution. For today, we have a very interesting, it's called APT Ross. So we are going to have a lot of fun discussing that. Before we do that, we are going to start with everybody's intros. I am going to start with my intro. And if you don't know me, Sam Gupta, principal at Elevate IQ. Elevate IQ is the independent ERP and digital transformation consulting firm. On that note, I am going to move to Dave for his intro. Thanks, Sam. Hey, everybody. My name is Dave Chrysler, and I own an operations consulting business working with leaders in the manufacturing and distribution spaces, uh, helping them to systemize and uh, do some business process optimization. I come to you with more than 20 years uh, in uh, various operations leadership roles and excited to be here with you all. Thanks for having me, Sam. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Dave. Andy, can I ask you to introduce yourself next? Yeah, thank you very much, Sam. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is Andy Pratico. I've been involved in ERP software for manufacturers for over four decades, which is a long, long time. I've worked all over North America, and uh, I have a book that uh, it's on Amazon, helps companies evaluate and uncover the truth about ERP systems. And I take particular pride in helping companies with that exact task. So there you go. Just Thanks, four decades uh, in the so short time. Oh, only four decades. Only yeah. four decades, yeah. 1981. <laughs> April of 1981. If only we could find some more experience on this panel. I know. That's the problem. <laughs> right. <laughs> Amazing, guys. Thank you so much for being here. And if you're in the audience, uh, make sure you guys post your questions and comments. We don't have a lot to talk about today. Um, So hopefully we can get some questions and we can address them. Uh, But for the most part, we are going to start with the briefing and then we'll be covering uh, the slides. So I am going to start with the corporate strategy as we always start, Dave and Andy. Um, and then you can chime in. Um, and I don't know, I mean, see how many other products we have reviewed for Aptine. I don't know. I, I, I would think this is probably going to be fourth or fifth. Fourth I or know. fifth for sure. Right. Yeah, we have up. done yeah. made to manage. We have done 
me to accent a last week i guess we have done M1. one uh that's well, ECI. Sorry, that's ECI. Yeah. pardon me that's ECI. uh App, what is appin has um, a lot yeah they they have a ton. I, I have to look it up how, which one, which ones we've done but we've done quite a few yeah I'm yeah sure there's still what many that we haven't done yeah and appin from the corporate strategy perspective they are very similar to infor in fact their products look very similar to infor i don't know uh, if they are sort of ganging up to make the blue color exactly the way blue is supposed to look uh, <laughs> you know for infor and appin uh, but there is something around appin and infor the way these companies started uh, they were started by finance people uh you know uh private equity and they wanted to sort of be the integrator as opposed to creator of the products um that's how aptin started so the mindset is very similar the way they think about the spaces aptin has their own sort of spaces uh and how they like to differentiate in the market but overall uh the philosophy in uh bringing these erp together uh is very similar obviously in four started this trend but um then the other erp vendors sort sort of followed suit overall in terms of the mindset i think aptin and four are pretty close the way apicor approaches the market is slightly different even though they have very similar strategy in how they approach the market in finding the purpose built product and and having those uh, in creating sort of the sweet uh, experience for the product eci is doing the same for the smaller spaces so in the case of aptin they are differentiator among these four five purpose built product is going to be that aptin like to differentiate in the europe market and uh, you know from the geo perspective they are trying to differentiate they are trying to play in slightly smaller market than in four and epic or uh, in general where they are uh, trying to play so aptin ross uh, if you review their screens obviously uh, the competitor for aptin ross is going to be eci decom that's going to be number 1 uh, in 4 m1 and in 4 m1 in general is a very strange product uh, because it can act like aptin accenta it can also act like aptin ross so in general in 4 m3 is a very interesting product now the other comparable for uh, aptin ross is going to be qad they are doing a lot more no uh, question uh, and and then process manufacturing now M3 uh, is more targeted at larger companies though aren't they or uh, in 4 M3 is definitely targeted for way larger but i'm talking about industry yeah. user for these products the process yeah exactly they are trying to target similar industries different size chx3 obviously is going to be here in general in terms of the that's industry. probably the number one competitor yep exactly so uh, we are looking at sage x3 we are looking at in 4m3 we are looking at ecid com we are looking at qad plex is doing a lot of fnb these days but overall when you look at the process versus discrete and for a lot of erp folks that's a very binary distinction uh, in general the way they like to think about uh, the erp market but when you get into the real process process you have no idea how complicated it is okay discrete is still okay process is a beast in general the way the processes are set up inside the industry each industry is going to be very different and that's why companies like to be extremely careful in terms of which process vertical they want to position themselves and for example let's say whatever may work for dairy may not work for chemical whatever may work for chemical may not work for food and beverage because the way these formulas are designed they are very different in general these patches are going to be very tight to your plm as well and each of these plms for these are going to be very different so in general the process verticals are far more complicated in general and even within process manufacturing each of the products are going to have its own sweet spot now when you look at the process manufacturing space okay there are a lot of different interesting layers in that as well okay so some of them are going to be let's say if you are a chemical manufacturer but if you are selling to aftermarket good luck with that because now we are talking about a lot of automotive flavors that you need to comply with because then you have to get into the you know you are in the automotive ecosystem and you need to comply with their compliance forecasting so it gets very interesting the way these things work then you might have Uh, e-commerce layer then you might have the transportation wms layer which is very common in these these spaces as well so again the process verticals are very 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 interesting the way they work and the way 
they operate and you are going to see that uh, inside these products. Dave, you unmuted uh, comments. Yeah, I, I more a question, Sam, because this isn't a space that I'm uh, that I've done much work in. I'm, you know, familiar, uh, especially in my uh, print uh, manufacturing days uh, from the ink suppliers uh, would be a great example yep. uh, of this. Right. Yeah. But my question is really around. So with that kind of infrastructure and complexity, do you see in this space a lot more bolt ons and kind of, you know, not out of the bunk? box functionality i'm just curious because it seems to me like you know especially for like snop planet like different components would really um you know you you'd probably be better suited to try to identify some additional components to to be able to take advantage of you know a full planning cycle with them yeah so great question and typically if you are going to find the boltons good luck with that it's okay it's going to be really tricky. So either you buy sweet or you buy a horizontal. Uh, okay, that's the approach that most companies should take. Some companies do it right way. Some companies do it difficult. Uh, okay, so when you are looking at the full suite experience, so for example, Appy in 4, Apicore, QAD, the way they approach the market, they are going to give you the box of everything that you are going to be needing. Now, if you are willing to replace everything, with their solution, great. As soon as you change one variable, good luck with that, because that becomes very complicated in general. Okay, uh, you are probably going to uh, end up paying more if you try to replace that. And the tighter the ecosystem is going to be, for example, in general, Aptin is a very closed ecosystem. They like to sell it in the box, even though they might claim that, you know what, I'll sell any component yeah. <laughs> of my, but their goal is to get foot in the door. I mean, that's what they are trying to do. And their goal is to sell, sort of sell the follow-on products. Uh, but in general, you are going to find two cases in the industry, the way industry likes to operate. Aptin, Info, what they are thinking in their head is, okay, they want to sell everything. Full suite experience, controlled by Aptin. You are not going to find consultants in the market who specialize on Aptin because Aptin is the one who is trying to get the professional services dollars. They are trying to get the support dollars. <laughs> okay. And the reason for that is because you don't have much of a talent outside, to be honest. Uh, you know, the way these products are structured, because they are probably carrying right now, how many? 50 products <laughs> or probably more. And when you are carrying as many products, it's very hard to create the, the same ecosystem that your uh, Microsoft, Oracle, SAP is going to have. Very different approach, very different mindset, depending upon where you are in your journey. If you are a very large company, for the most part, you are probably going to go for slightly more horizontal ERP because you are probably involved in a lot of different MNEs. If you are going to be this tight overall from the, your business model perspective, it becomes very difficult to scale. Let's say today you are supplying ink, but tomorrow you are buying a company trying to vertically integrate and maybe you want to buy a print manufacturing company. If you want to buy, welcome to a new ERP. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, well, you know, a lot of these systems like Ross, and you mentioned uh, XG and, and a couple other ones that are targeted, or, that are ER, true ERPs tar targeted for the process manufacturing. <clears throat> most of them have most of what a process manufacturer will need. So the bolt-on thing isn't as required. However, you'll notice in the smaller projects, like, uh, you know, I know one company that bought SAP Business One, and they bought this add-on called Process Pro, yeah, which is very popular. So so in the smaller ones, they'll, or, or from QuickBooks, and they'll add on Process Pro. So on these smaller projects, commonly you'll note bolt-ons more often, whereas in the larger projects, these systems should have most of what they need. Exactly. So depending upon whether you want to go to that route, that's one possibility where you are buying add-on. In case of Process Pro, it's still a decent add-on in my mind because that has a lot of installation. But there are going to be some add-ons that are probably going to have two installations. Okay. So even if you're buying SAP Business One and a product has two installations, good luck with the quality of the code because they cannot afford to pay too much. <laughs> the, the hiccup there, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sam, but the hiccup, whenever you do a bolt-on, I don't care if it's Process Pro or whatever it is, is you have that thing in the middle called an interface, and you always have challenges with upgrades, especially with upgrades, juggling the main accounting system with the interface with the bolt-on. But I'll tell you what I really, really I advise people about, against bolt-ons is um, n you never have two software companies that have a consistent relationship and strong relationship forever. Eventually, that relationship will erode. 
And if it erodes and you have one of those two, you're in trouble. Exactly, Andy. But I mean, you know, that problem you are probably going to get with a lot of internal add-ons as well, because they all are fighting with each other. So yes, uh, you are absolutely right that that is going to be a problem. But there are going to be some add-ons that are probably equally good as the internal add-ons. Internal add-ons, the kind of challenges that we have seen in our experience is going to be related to support, regardless of whether those two absolutely. teams are owned by... Yeah. <laughs> in four or by third party. Obviously, when you have third party, just another layer. Support self the window because yeah. you're dealing with somebody else. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, but I mean, even with Process Pro, I don't know if you are going to get everything that you are going to get with the suite approach, to be honest, because these businesses, in my mind, need a lot more. Yeah. Uh, you know, from the TMS perspective, from WMS perspective, inbuilt fleet functionality, no they are going to have their own fleet. The QC is so complicated. <laughs> you name it. Process Pro is more for the entry level. It'll do a fine job. But as soon as you get to a certain size, you got to start looking at something more of an enterprise. So yeah, and they typically have a lot of admin overhead in general. They are managing a lot of processes uh, on a spreadsheet. They are not managing everything. I mean, they are just going to be jumping around. That's how most businesses are, especially these ones. They are not going to get the, the full experience of the ERP. Their processes are probably not going to be as mature. So depending upon, I guess, the maturity cycle, where you are overall in terms of your planning, how mature do you want to get with your operations? That's what is going to dictate what is going to work. But typically, most businesses are all over the place. I mean, they're Nobody is like 100% mature. I'm yet to see that business. Unless you are probably going to be private equity owned, right, Dave? <laughs> I, mean, I, I, think, I think even in that space, uh, <laughs> you'd be hard pressed to find that. But yes, it would be impressive to it would be impressive uh, impressive to uncover that unicorn. <laughs> That's what everyone says about me, though. They, they don't say I'm mature. They say I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> Andy is so much fun. Andy is so much fun. <laughs> okay, guys, so touching on some more layers here with respect to the solution before we move to the slides. So I guess we had really good debate there overall from the process perspective. Now, when you look at the ROS solution, this is probably one of the go-to products for Aptain. Uh, in general, they are committed to the process and food and beverage. Uh, they have a lot more revenue coming from food and beverage and PTC verticals in general, the way they like to think, the kind of acquisition strategy that they have had. Uh, their acquisition strategy has been very aligned in general with food and beverage. They have acquired WMS, which has had a lot of installations in the food and beverage space. They have acquired some of the industry for zero capability. So this is probably their go-to uh, product. Now, overall, from the interface perspective, Andy, I don't know if you know uh, more than what I do. I mean, see, especially in the public demos, we could not find a ton of demos. Obviously, it's a very close guarded system. These guys don't want to tell anything, okay, unless you get into a sales call. Then only you get to know what this product is. Then you get too much. <laughs> right? Uh, so that's how closed the system is. Like, there is like zero documentation available for you are an outsider. If you are an Aptain salesperson, then you have access to pretty much everything. <laughs> but if you are not Aptain salesperson, uh, you don't get to see anything uh, unless you are willing to pay to Aptain. So that's the challenge overall with these closed systems as well as the network. But uh, I could not find if the interface is modernized, especially in their YouTube demos that they have published. It's very outdated screens right now. And for the most part, their goal, and Aptin was owned by Vista Equity, the way they like to um, uh, work overall, if you look at their portfolio companies, whether you talk about uh, Kibo that we have reviewed recently, which is the first player, but they are focusing on the marketing part of the 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 makeup or the cosmetic changes that's what they like to do. okay so they acquire these companies because you know these mom and pop vendors are probably not gonna, uh, as much r d sorry as much dollars overall for the sales and marketing so they are making the cosmetic changes they are not improvising the product itself Aptin also uh spends a lot uh, overall in terms of the support and they are known to have really good support because if you don't get support from Aptin then I don't know where you are going to get from because nobody else knows those products. Uh, and you don't have any documentation, so good luck with that. <laughs> uh, but luckily, at least with Aptin, Aptin is decent, at least with, with this. Now, you guys have any other comments uh, before I move on to these slides? No? 
all right guys so uh we typically touch as part of these videos many different layers so this is uh, the market position layer and we are looking at their claims in terms of the kind of you know claims they are making in the marketing material and then we sort of validate that with the data that we get from many other perspectives so here they are trying to claim that they are looking for growing mid market specialty chemicals pharmaceutical biotech organizations and food and beverage manufacturers now when you look at mid market mid market could mean a lot of different things and andy always likes to <laughs> ask me okay what is the size here <laughs> if you look at some of the reviews that we found okay so those reviews are companies with 5000 to 500 to 1000 some of them are there then 1000 to 5000 that's probably the max, uh, that we have been able to find shockingly enough okay for some reason those large companies are able to survive on these now we don't have enough details whether they are using this at the subsidiary level or at the division level sometimes that is also the case sometimes the way the erp products is going to be used that is going to drive whether it can really support the transactions that you are going to be performing on the erp and how slow it is going to be because again every database has sort of size in mind in terms of which business can it handle so you need to keep that in mind and again everything matters well, how many transactions are you processing and what is going to be the length of those transactions as well when you look at the it operational capacity and it's no different than your inventory planning or <laughs> operations plan it's the same number of variables that you need to check and you need to figure out okay what kind of uh, solution do you need for that so mid market could be tricky uh, then they are talking about specialty chemicals pharmaceutical biotech organizations and food and beverage manufacturers that's fair uh, they are definitely in the chemicals pharma biotech food and beverage um those four for the most part i don't know if they are going to find everything that a pharma manufacturer is going to need they will struggle uh, especially when you talk about all of those dscs compliance i don't know if they have a sort of the the skin or the layer or what do you call that addition and the uh, yeah some people call it. <laughs> uh, there could be that but pharma is very deep in general uh, the kind of things that they are going to be needing unless your customer now uh, here they are talking about ensuring compliance and recallability and recallability is very interesting layers as well that you are going to see in this and sometimes you know the way these products are designed and the kind of you know markets they target so a discrete manufacturing product is also going to target uh, the process manufacturing verticals and sometimes it's almost a shock why is a discrete manufacturing product targeting uh, the process manufacturing because the most natural extension for a discrete manufacturing for example let's say qad is primarily a discrete manufacturing plex primarily a discrete manufacturing product okay but they are also targeting process manufacturing because if you look at the the transactions the way the kind of verticals they target in their uh in the discrete uh, okay some of the processes that those guys are going to need for example automotive automotive have a little adjacency the way it works with the chemicals because dave's example okay ink manufacturer selling to print is going to be very similar to your print manufacturer so that's where these uh, sort of layers are coming from because these guys the way they sell these products if they are they start selling to automotive the next logical extension is going to be who else is hanging out in the automotive market that's how these products are designed that's how their go to market strategies are designed so that's why sometimes you know the the automotive product naturally is going to sell to your food and beverage it's going to sell to uh, the pharma that's how uh, they they work they don't sell to aerospace because aerospace has very different processes in general so it's very 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 interesting the way the products evolve what size of a pharma uh, manufacturer would uh, qad be a fit so qad definitely targets slightly larger accounts in general qad is is a larger product okay it is okay. localized so for example when you look at actin ross it is designed for that one site many sites mm. uh, you know those kind of man small to mid size exactly exactly qad is a far more global product i think the mm. right comparable for qad is going to be in 4m3 uh, gotcha. that's so like the, the right 250 one. million or larger size uh, qad does sell in these smaller verticals uh, but for the most part 100 million plus is what you're looking 100 at. million okay yeah. yeah yeah that makes sense yeah and that's very similar positioning to in 4m3 yes they officially they are going to say uh, 
uh, you know, 250, but 250, but yeah. they'll come down to 100. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, very similar positioning. I would say the Sage X3 also has very similar positioning. Uh, Sage X3 uh, in general is going to be slightly richer product uh, from the finance perspective because obviously it's a very deep financial product. But uh, it scales definitely. down though too, doesn't it? It's got smaller customers too. Sage X3? Yeah. Am I How wrong? small are we talking about, Andy? <laughs> I'm posing your own question to you. <laughs> 20 million? 20 million Sage X3, are you serious? Am I wrong? I don't know. I mean, yes, I have seen some, uh, but that could be a stretch in my mind. Yeah, you might be uh, right. You might be right. That that could be a stretch because Sage X3 in general is a bigger product, but you could be right because I've also heard, I mean, they are selling to discrete verticals, uh, but in general, the way Sage X3 product is designed, you are not going to get as much operational functionality, uh, you know, so sometimes, you know, these smaller manufacturers, they are literally checking the boxes and whoever is going to have more boxes, those are the products that they are going to buy. They are not looking at the development talent. They are not looking at customizability. They are not looking at documentation. They are not looking at localization, globalization. Once you get to, let's say, a billion dollar, okay, you have a very different IT organization. You are going to have very different philosophy that you are going to, uh, or even $500 million organizations, they think very differently because they are trying to sort of segment all of these capabilities in their buckets and they have very different architecture in general, the way they like to think. Uh, but when you look at these smaller customers, their mindset is that uh, they are looking for that sweet uh, functionality. So they will not appreciate Sage X3 in my mind. And the reason for that is they are not getting as much for their money. <laughs> Mm. Um, but bigger customers, they are going to appreciate because they are getting far deeper financials than you are going to get into that public reporting, servants Oxley, auditing, uh, right. then you have slightly mature CFO who really understand, you know, how to basically make money from ERP systems, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Strong <laughs> FDA certifications and things like for QA and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, CFOs that have gone through, let's say, four or five rounds, they sort of understand uh, you know, where these strengths are of most ERP systems. So you need to go through as many cycles to be able to understand how to sort of, but, but by that time, by the time you are going to do fifth, you are probably going to get it. Uh, so that's the reality of ERP industry, I guess. <laughs> I've heard the Q, uh, QAD quality module is like one of the best. Um, QAD likes to be very, uh, you know, conservative the way they like to approach market in general. And uh, if you look at their market positioning overall from the, the, the kind of, you know, patches that they like, uh, they are extremely picky. Uh, they like to go after the verticals where they are going to be successful overall from the product and the manufacturing operations. And that's how you should be selecting ERP in general. Uh, quality module could mean a lot of different things. Okay. Quality processes are very different when you go from one industry to the next. For example, let's say if you go to chemical. Okay, chemical, the kind of terms that they are going to be using, the kind of, you know, test cases that they are going to have, the kind of sampling that you are going to be doing, the kind of SPC you are going to be using for your software, completely yeah. different guys, completely different. Okay, data yeah. is going to have very different. So even though, uh, for example, in 4 and 3, they like to talk about process. But again, inside process, the, everything is very different in general, the way, uh, you know, the, the quality processes work as well as the way your uh the formula sort of evolves during the process itself yeah so here guys i mean the compliance and recallability is what we were touching on recallability is very com going to be very common in the case of automotive and that's why these companies are able to target food because food is going to have the similar recallability so that's why it's just easier to sort of attack that vertical you are going to have recallability you are probably going to have qc Automotive is big on QC as well. So it's not just the bomb. I mean, it's just easier to create the formula as opposed to creating everything else that the other uh, discrete verticals are going to be needing. So that's the overall mindset, how these uh, products design their capabilities and how they sort of structure their roadmap. Um, uh, well, okay. it's, you know, obviously uh, with any type of uh, product that's um, Potentially going to be consumed, you know, food, beverage, whatever the case, but uh, supplements, any any drugs, pharma, you need shelf life and yep. uh, an expiry date. This is obvious that that's designed ex exactly for that industry. Exactly. But I mean, you could actually need that in the agriculture space as well, but this product is not going to work. No. Uh, agriculture has very different SNOP processes. It's very detail centric of the way agriculture space works. So again, there are always layers. And it gets very complicated, to be honest, okay? 
And you need to know these layers from the product psychology perspective. Otherwise, you will struggle with the episode. Um, so here, yes, the expired date and the short shelf life is going to be important. That's why they are able to target food and bath. But they are not targeting agriculture because it's not going to work for it. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, but they are also not targeting any sort of distribution. Agriculture tend to be slightly more distribution retail centric organizations in general. So they are not targeting all of that. And then Dave likes to talk about the operational processes. That's a different beast altogether when you look at the agriculture because we are looking at the uh, crop yield, farm yield. Right, Dave? Well, well, and commonly with a process type product, it's continuous process. Okay, so now we are opening another conversation. Okay, when you look at the... <laughs> continuous process it's very different okay so none of the erp that i know really work in those spaces to be honest okay because you don't know how to sort of cost <laughs> because continuous is supposed to be continuous the oil is running so where do you define the bar <laughs> okay so that's where the real challenge is to be honest if you and andy froze i guess i don't know if uh you know he has that uh funny face um <laughs> it does look like he's frozen yeah 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 so andy i don't know if you can hear us but um uh the continuous is a very different patch and once andy comes back we'll probably touch on that uh but for now dave unless you have any other comment we can uh, move to the next one yeah we can move on uh okay need to watch for andy as well once back so i'll uh, minimize my screen here um so here uh we are talking about traceability and the way traceability works to be honest it's very interesting because one of the things that i dave i don't know whether you guys are able to notice or not uh you know here we are looking at trucks can you believe this okay like literally trucks are part of the traceability <laughs> and when you say trucks are part of the traceability uh what it means is you know you need to have the logistics integrated as part of your operations and that's why some of the products that do really well in the food and beverage agriculture space always going to have the logistics that is going to be integrated as part of your erp processes microsoft dynamics is probably the best example okay they like to play really well in the food and beverage even though they are not going to have as much last mile functionality but they win a lot in food and beverage and that's why they had to design the cms as part of your erp experience now that's a very different product okay each erp is going to have some sort of integration some like to embed their snop qad snop big time the whole erp is designed around snop okay if you have to use those as the same snop process with any other product you are looking at a completely different product. in four has a completely different product for supply chain okay when you look at the end to end traceability of supply chain when you get into that control tower functionality where you look at the oms scenarios wms tms so you are looking at very different product but you are never going to have that embedded experience not every business needs embedded experience but in some patches for example agriculture you probably need that that's why qad has designed it this way that's why you have the the in this particular case and now if you look at the qad product qad has acquired hcm product okay that's a very learning compliance labor productivity experience on the shop floor which is very interesting because that's a hcm product okay that was always sort of the hcm category but hcm is also embedded with your shop floor experience for example let's say if you look at plex okay the way plex mes is designed the whole hr product the hcm product it has a lot of functionality pre baked as part of you now that's a different beast because if you go to your automotive sector these processes need to be part of your mes if you don't have that you cannot schedule and the reason for that is because the skill set is very important okay you need to know which welder has which particular certification and if they are qualified to work on that specific process you are going to find this specific process in food and beverage pharma so there are process similarities across the industries even though erp industry always like to put under are you process are you discrete that's what a sales person is going to know <laughs> well that's what they're going to ask you straight off the hop anyways exactly and andy since you are back i mean we were talking about the continuous operations continuous operations it's a very 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 different beast so far i honestly speaking i personally don't have as much experience i only have experience of failures so if you want to talk about failures i'm more than happy to talk <laughs> well okay. yeah continuous process versus batch process exactly exactly so in the continuous process when you are running the the whole pipe when you are looking at the real uh, pipeline pipeline operations there is yeah. no sort of fixed period where your process starts 24/7 so exactly so you sort of don't know 
Well, 24 cross 7 could be in automotive as well, okay? Uh, but in the automotive, you at least have a product and you know what is going inside that product, okay? But in the case of continuous operations, oil well, okay? Uh, mining, I would say they do a lot of continuous as well in terms of process. So there is no sort of state of a product. There is no bar, okay? It's all continuous. So how do you define the boundaries? It's a huge challenge. You yeah. don't know what your product is costing. So the only way that most companies... There are some mom and pop ERP systems that do well in those spaces. I don't know what they do, to be honest. Okay, so they are probably going to just compute. Okay, whatever <laughs> oil flew in this one hour divided by whatever product that you have created, probably that's probably going to be right there. And they are probably filling those tanks, and based on the tanks, they are probably going to identify the product, or maybe based on later, or I don't know. But it's very complicated the way the operations, work. the way accounting, scheduling. It's it, it's a different ball. Yeah. So continuous is good. Any other comments, guys? Okay. So here we are looking at traceability, right? So traceability is very interesting. You need your logistics data. If you don't have that, and this is going to be reported to regulatory bodies, okay? They care for us, okay? <laughs> so you have to have that as part of your ERP. If you don't have, if you are going to have gaps in your ERP versus your TMS, good luck with that. Um, that could be a challenge if they come to know that you have real gaps. Because they are literally looking for end-to-end -end traceability. And sometimes these guys are trying to be creative overall from their manufacturing process perspective. And I don't know whether I uh, told you guys a story of one of the shops that I was at. And they had created, they were in the needle business, right? Now, these needles are very hard to sort of manufacture because they have to punch holes in those needles. So what they had done is they had literally, uh, you know, stamped those needles on, on a coil. And the coil used to roll inside the machine. Uh, okay, so that's how they had created. Now, when you are going to cost it, the, the coil, it's a different ball game. the way it works. It's all wasted product. But they had to do, do this because they have to, number one, be traceable. The Each of the needles that is going through your process, you need to trace the material, the lot, the batch. Can you believe it? It gets that complicated. Hmm. So... <laughs> It's a very interesting operation the way it works. It, it gets to be complicated, but with more advanced systems, either a barcode scan or some type of electronic data collection or even direct integration of the machine usually can capture that data pretty easy. And where are you going to put the barcode on a needle? <laughs> <laughs> now, sometimes you don't have to have the barcode on the actual product. Sometimes you have a sheet saying needle barcode next to your screen or or like i said a, a touch screen type data collection device or in uh straight mes where you're hooked into the actual machine for production capture. yeah it gets very interesting again that's a very continuous operation the way they are doing i mean they typically you know or you put the barcode on the needle too <laughs> you can do that right and <laughs> <laughs> i'd have to use different glasses <laughs> As long as you are not injecting that needle on me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> because that's going to be a really thick needle, exactly. I guess. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so it gets very interesting the way manufacturing operations work because obviously each of these layers are probably going to be applicable in terms of which ERP is going to work for you. So, overall, it's it's very fascinating. Um, now, but, but you, you know, like these, you know, these, this might be an older software, but these screens are... They have a nice graphical look to them. Um, nice is very subjective, Andy. Okay. I know that. I know that. <laughs> so this is probably IE5, IE6 experience, maybe 7. Uh, Dave, you can tell me, you know, which one it is. So I always like to define the, the numbers there, right? So IE is probably the best example in terms of the UX. So if you're looking at uh, a system in 2023, you are probably looking at, you know, Edge or Chrome or something similar to that, right? So I think that's how you should be defining the user experience. So this is not modernized. This is not re-architected. This is most certainly not cloud native. Okay. Obviously, they are trying to pretend, but every a lot of companies are trying. Some of them have simply changed the UI to make it pretty because most customers don't understand that. <laughs> but the backend is still COBOL. Uh, <laughs> uh, but here, the, the, even these screens are not modern. The only thing they uh, app team in this stack would they like to do is they are simply going to make the marketing changes. So the website is going to look pretty. The demos are going to look pretty. Right. The decks are going to look pretty. Product, who cares? As long as they buy. Once you are signed, once you have signed five-year contract, good luck Somebody with that. Take care of you. Not me. <laughs> exactly. 
Um, so here, if you look at the, the kind of reporting, so this is the reporting screen chart that we are looking at. And here you have to report the carrier name. Can you believe that? The regulatory bodies, they care for this. Okay, the, give me the, the whole traceability when the recall is going to be there. So there is going to be a name or because that company is involved and they need to know whoever is actually just the product. In pharma, they want, they care for every single entity that is touching the product. Uh, here we have version stage, yield unit, yield total input, yield total output, yield percentage. And again, yield, 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 yield. So many different yields, right? And that's very common in the process space in general, uh, the way they look at because productivity is very important for companies, the way they like to think, the way they like to. Um, and again, if you're going to be using a discrete product in this space, good luck with that. But let's say if you have the discrete plus process mix in your business model, it could become very tricky um, to implement. And again, you need to look at the percentage. Uh, and there are just too many variables, I guess, to decide which ERP is going to be most efficient. Even the MES is very different in general, the way it works, the kind of measurements it is going to have. Yes, OE is very common, but here also you are looking at yield. So it's a very, very, very different experience. It's not the same MES that you're going to find. Strawberry uh, jam, boy. <laughs> Makes me hungry. <laughs> exactly. Me too. Any other comments? If not, then we are looking at some of the user reviews here. And this is coming from 2020. And there you go. How would, what size of company this is targeting? Exactly. And sometimes I'm shocked, to be honest, okay? Because when you look at the 1,000 to 5,000, you're almost close to a billion dollars in revenue. Oh, in yeah. Mind, right? That's pretty sizable company for Eptine Ross. That's... Yeah. But I mean, typically these guys are using two, three different ERP system and they are probably using at divisional and level. They, they apparently system. love this. Yeah. Yeah. But they just don't know what they don't know. Um, <laughs> they've already got it. They better love it. They better love it. Yeah. Yeah. So here we are talking about quality group for audits and any product that is required, which is very nice time saver. Because again, nice time saver is a very subjective phase there. You have not seen what other products and the processes and the companies can do. Once you know that, then you will know how much you can save money in operational efficiency until you know you are probably going to be happy with what, what you got. For me, in materials, production, planning, and distribution, the ERP functions in inventory, job creation, and the soon-to-be-implemented plan it together have the most impact. Of, I don't know what that is, to be honest. That did nothing meaningful. The system itself does not seem to be very intuitive, obviously, because of the, once you start using it, the only thing you are going to know in your heart is something is not right. <laughs> they just don't understand because business users don't really have as much programming or the technology background to be able to understand how user interfaces work. The only thing they are going to feel is it's not intuitive. Well, they don't, exactly. And, and they don't know what they don't know. Exactly. I mean, they're, you know, they've been probably using this product for who knows how many years. So they are fluent and they know how to navigate this product, but they don't know why it should be different. And so exactly. they like it. Did you so, have a comment? Well, just to that point, uh, quick, Andy, uh, there is a time used on this on this slide, less than 12 months in the uh, oh, upper left. Oh, yeah. I, didn't, I was looking at the arrow at the top, right? But that, yeah. But that was March of 2020 was last night. Yeah, yeah. So it's three years, four years. But yeah. we don't know if they like it still now. You're right. Yeah, it was like they just went live at 12 months, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a good observation to be on. That's a good, great comment as well. Really good. I, <laughs> I was looking strictly at, at, at Sam's arrow there, not at the... Yeah. No, but I mean, the comment is really great, Andy, because, you know, initially you are probably going to like it because you are going to get something better than what you had before. But once you start getting into the depth of the product, then you'll know how much problem you are going to have. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, ch chances are that audit team was uh, dealing with a lot of Excel crunching <laughs> exactly. to capture that data previously. But yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Within a year, it's very hard to know. I mean, probably you have done once of, you know, a couple of closes. You have managed. A year is a very short time after going live to know whether the product right. is you don't, you don't, You don't know what you don't know. Yeah, the, there should be more opportunity to drill down from within versus having to go from one tab to another to get the information. So traceability is what 
they are talking about in general in these smaller products you are not going to have as superior traceability that you are going to find slightly in. so two things uh, to take away from this particular slide number one is going to be the older products are not going to be as intuitive they are also not going to be as traceable because the older data model was not as traceable in general okay it was very difficult to correlate these data elements and that's why they were so difficult to use the newer systems they have far superior traceability built as part of the relational model so you are going to again in this you are working hard you just don't know you don't feel right that's what you are going to know <laughs> but smaller products in general the traceability is going to be really so that's the issue then we have 2017 so roughly what 8 years now they have been using for 2 years 2017 so they must have started in 2015 so 8 years in total company size and again i'm shocked based on the company size uh, that this product is using and i did interview some of the customers that were using aptin loss and i'm sometimes i'm shocked i'm like okay i don't know how you are using it i mean i had a billion dollar uh, you know customers that were on aptin and they were doing it. like okay how are your transactions i don't know i mean they probably i'm missing something here but uh, <laughs> maybe they don't have as many transactions i guess and that could be they are able to survive on that but sometimes it's just shocking that such a small product can work for such large um here they are talking about definitely customer focused and listen to customer user community so that's a comment about aptin that in general they are very friendly for customers they are known to have really good support in general but the when i spoke to some of the customers that were switching that were getting switched on aptin they were not happy with the support because the previous support was better so when they were into more mom and pop setting they provided far more sort of the consulting expertise the support because they are not going to have as much legal obligations when you are dealing with a company that is going to be owned by private equity or they are going to be public they go through very different scrutiny in terms of what kind of support they can provide and sometimes it's not just about them knowing the concept sometimes they don't want to help you because that could be a legal obligation for them because of the uh, obligation so keep in mind i mean product companies they go through different scrutiny so you are not going to get the same help that you might get either from mom and pop uh, product companies or mom and pop consulting company okay here another one i mean see most of them are fairly big in size because the reason for that is in this space you know a lot of companies cannot compete sap is probably not going to compete microsoft does compete uh, you know oracle is probably not going to test this in my mind unless you are talking about jd edwards which is which had the process functionality now oracle cloud erp i don't know how deep they are in process but for the most part you are looking at a lot of it's uh, to be successful in this uh, vertical here we are talking about and that could be the reason why aptin is so successful uh, here and they are able to target such large account so this is food and beverage uh, two years 2019 uh one of the comment and this is where the interesting things go okay so the people who have used the product for a long time what they have done is they have made your screens prettier but when you are going to get into the real customization the only people who can customize this product are going to be number one aptin and even inside aptin there are going to be two people who are going to know the product so good luck with that customize number one they are going to be unreachable number two <laughs> they are going to be super expensive and number three they might not even understand your requirement or they might not care <laughs> because they are so much in demand in general the way they like to think or the way they like to work so again that's a huge risk in my mind uh, when i look at some of these products which are going to have the programming language from 1970s uh, they had made some cosmetic changes on the product and somehow made it look great so if you are simply looking at functional checkpoints and the <laughs> pretty demos good luck with that product <laughs> because it's going to be fun once you start using it you need to look under the hood and you need a mechanic who can really understand what is uh, inside the product itself to be able to identify these issues but again once you dig deeper into the layers of the reviews that's where you are going to find and here the user has very clearly reported that the development language is not mainstream i don't know what they are using most likely they must be on cobol for the most i don't think they have changed the back end uh, they have not even changed the front end architecture because obviously it's very and i don't know how many customer aptin ross has um well they used they certainly had i mean it's been around for decades you certainly had a very strong following whether the, how strong that following is today uh, i'm not yeah but indeed you understand how expensive developers are even if they open oh. their mouth that's 100 dollars right there oh, okay so when they are going to code out. and test <laughs> Yep, link uh, around. Yeah, it's like going for a court case and lawyers billing, you know. Um it takes fortune to build these products when you are looking at products like that. Um so when you are carrying 200 products there is no way in the hell you can uh, modernize the backend architecture. You cannot afford that. 
no company can afford that. Nobody has, they cannot justify. Um, that's the problem. So one more review. Uh, we have six minutes right now. Let me cover this and then we can probably open up for, do you guys have a lot to talk? Do you want to talk or do you want to review? <laughs> which, uh, which, which, you guys tell me. Review. Dave, review or comment? Review? Uh, I, yeah, let's let's cover this last review, I'd say. Okay. So here, one of the things that they have mentioned is the process-based costing. So what do you like best about Aptine process manufacturing? And they have used the term called process-based costing and tracking. That's a very unique term uh, in general. And the way the process-based costing is going to be very different in general, the way your costing works in your district. And this particular uh, you know, user has appreciated that because obviously it's aligned to what they want to see in a product. So again, look into that. That's a very specific term and variability. So if you are evaluating this for the process batch, make sure the product has for that. A lot tracking is excellent. User experience is slightly behind the market. One more confirmation, a lot traceability cost tracking. Trace express lot trace went, went from hours to minutes. Uh, costing is complex, but very configurable. Again, it depends upon where the user is coming from. I don't think this user may have as much experience overall in complex ERP. So that's why they might be thinking that it's probably complex. Uh, but that's it for the review. I have got five well, minutes. One of the and... comments on that last review is that get buy-in from the highest levels. And, you know, uh, generically speaking, I understand that's how people investigate and evaluate systems. They try to get buy-in. They try to get everyone on the same page. And then they buy the system. That's the biggest vote. And, and uh, you know, I was doing a webinar three weeks ago uh, on how to select ERP software. And one of the persons that was attending it was interesting what he said because he evaluated software with his previous company. They ended up buying the large uh, 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 Dynamics FNO system, but it didn't have a functionality that he was he was supply chain manager. It didn't have a functionality that he absolutely must have. However, he was only one vote. There was ten other votes. Yeah. So he got outvoted, and you know. It, it, it always blows my mind how people do these evaluations and how they try to figure out which is the best ERP for them. You want to talk to companies that are similar to yourself. In this case, uh, food process or, or chemical debt process or somebody similar to yourself that's already using these systems and find out what it is they don't like. That's the other thing about when you're calling references. So often it's delegated to somebody who doesn't even want to make the call at all. And they say, how do you like it? And the person says, oh, it's okay. And then they go, oh, yeah, it's fine. And then that's it. And they don't have a clue. Focus and ask what it is. Because every ERP has things you don't like. I don't care yeah. which one it is. They all have pros and cons. Find out what it is you don't like. And then decide whether you can live with that. Because as you're going through the implementation, number one, you don't want surprises. And number two, you got to put up with that. So you got to know in advance so you can start planning around those challenges. Sorry for rambling. <laughs> they work. Worthwhile as always, Andy. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think, I think one of the interesting kind of, you know, thoughts I had throughout this one is, Sam, you kind of mentioned it, and it, it's come up in some previous uh, discussions. But I think what's really interesting from my perspective is, you know, when you are kind of separate outside of the evaluation phase and and selecting, right? Because so often we go into organizations where something's pre-existing, but what they do have is, you know, some sort of a growth plan that they're executing against. And that could be acquisition strategy, that could be new product development, those types of things. So one of the things that really stood out for me today, uh, again, because I'm not, you know, I haven't done a ton of work in the process manufacturing space, but, you know, as you're thinking about your business and those plans and, and how that growth, uh, how you're going to achieve those growth goals, you know, understanding what the different business models are that you're ultimately investigating, whether that's mm -hmm. through product development and or acquisition strategy. I mean, that's going to have a huge impact yeah. on your overall system architecture. And I think it's not something that a lot of people, uh, you know, are thinking about. It's an afterthought. And today for me, that really stood out just because of kind of the uniqueness of the process flow for a process manufacturing <laughs> business compared to, you know, what we typically talk about. So I just, I felt like that was kind of a good takeaway for today uh, in terms of 
people thinking about how this system architecture really comes together uh, to support what their ultimate plans are, you know, from a from a growth standpoint. Yeah, the shocking part there in that comment, Dave, to be honest, I mean, even the private equity does not, when they're buying the company, <laughs> they are not think, even looking at. <laughs> I think that's kind of the point though, right? It's like, it's a complete afterthought and I've seen it firsthand, which is really yeah. interesting because, you know, kind of, in a perfect world, right? You would think that this was this was not an afterthought. That this was very planned out. That you have an idea of what kind of infrastructure you're going to need to put in place from a, a system standpoint, especially in that world, because I mean that's how they're making their money, right? Yeah. It's it's so it's really wild to me. I mean, I just for whatever reason it really stood out to me today uh, going through. Them, so yeah, and I mean I have seen this all the time. To be honest, I mean that's why sometimes the private equity acquisitions are million dollar disasters because you are right i mean the only thing they are doing is number one system architecture improvement number two marketing uh, what value add do they have i mean they might bring talent that's it right three things what else can they do uh, yeah. i don't think they do anything else uh, and if one of them is going to be disaster how are you going to make your money <laughs> yeah yeah and on the opposite side of that you know privately held you think about you know people are are in, in, in a lot of cases, they are developing the market after they've already decided on the product, which means that this is, you know, not a conversation either, right? There is no infrastructure or, or system architecture that is going into the evaluation of saying like, well, how are we going to support this from, you know, from that aspect and how can we leverage, you know, either what we have or looking at some alternatives to be able to, you know, again, fully optimize what we're talking about launching. It's, it's, it's really incredible. So pretty interesting today. Amazing guys. Any more short comments? No. All right, guys, that's it for today. If you joined for the first time, this was part of our industry series for which we meet every Tuesday at uh, 5 p.m. Eastern. So make sure you guys are going to be here next week. We are going to come back with another review. On that note, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. I cannot thank our guests enough for coming on the show, for sharing their knowledge and journey. I always pick up learnings from our guests, and hopefully you learned something new today. If you want to learn more about Dave Chrysler, head over to thechrysler.club. It's T-H-E-C-R-Y-S-L-E-R dot C-L-U-B. If you want to learn more about ND Practical, head over to esoft.com. It's E-S-S-O-F-T dot com. Links and more information will also be available in the show notes. Also, don't forget to subscribe and spread the word among folks with similar backgrounds. If you have any questions or comments about the show, please review and rate us on your favorite podcasting platform or DM me on any social channels. I'll try my best to respond personally and make sure you get help. Thank you, and I hope to get you on the next episode of the WBS Podcast. Thank you for listening to another episode of the WBS Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. For more information on growth strategies for SMBs using ERP and digital transformation, check out our community at wbs.rocks. We'll see you next time.